So hello everyone and welcome uh, to Meet the Experts, our postgraduate live online Q&A information session. My name is Patrick Cosgrove and I'm the Student Recruitment Officer here at Mary Immaculate College. And tonight we're looking at the arts, education and funding. I'm joined by Dr. Julianne Stack, Graduate School Director in the Research and Graduate School, Dr. Emma O'Brien, Director of Taught Postgraduate Studies and Education, and Dr. Ronan Flatley, Assistant Dean of Arts in Academic Affairs. So welcome everyone, and um, we'll hopefully cover quite a lot over the next uh, 45 minutes. So for everyone that has just uh, joined us, if you want to ask a question to any of our panel uh, over the next 45 minutes, all you have to do is just pop into the Q&A function, type in your question and I'll put it to the guys at some stage. So please do feel free at any stage to uh, type in a question and we will put it to put it to either Ronan, Emma or Julianne um, at, at some point. So maybe just to start us off, we might just get um, our three panelists just to give a brief overview. So we might just maybe start with you, Emma, first, if that's OK. Maybe just to give kind of a brief overview of the uh, Faculty of Education programmes uh, and that whole side of the house. Hi everyone, um, so welcome this evening and thank you for coming tonight to hear all about our programmes. We're delighted to meet you all. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of Faculty of Education, um, top postgraduate programmes that we have and kind of the learning environment you can expect um, should you come decide to come to MIC to study. So and um, the Faculty of Education, we have a variety of uh, postgraduate programmes, 12 in total. These uh, vary from CERT, Diploma and Masters, uh, top Masters programmes and also top PhD programmes that um, Julianne will probably talk about in a little while. So I'll just focus largely on the Certificate, Diploma and um, Masters programme. So there's kind of a variety of disciplines. Um, the main discipline areas we look at are leadership. So there's programmes in middle leadership, education leadership and, and management, uh, leadership of well-being uh, and uh, digital leadership. Um, we also have programmes in well-being and that would be the well-being and, and leadership programme. Uh, we have a programme in global citizenship and sustainability and an MA in human rights education. Um, we also have um, a stream in, in uh, inclusive education. So we have a diploma in special education and inclusive education, a master's in inclusive education, a graduate certificate in autism studies and a diploma and master's in autism studies. Um, we have uh, a CERT diploma and MED in digital leadership and education also. Um, so the way that the kind of stream programs are structured, they kind of respond to a lot of the new areas of the primary curriculum and new curricular areas. So things like well-being, global citizenship, um, digital leadership um, and, and leadership as a, as, a, as a whole concept. Sorry, we also have a programme in literacy and, and leadership and li leadership and literacy education. So they they align to a lot of the new uh, contemporary areas that are becoming more prevalent within ed education. Um, and we experience quite a demand in those areas because a lot of curricula are being um, revised in those areas and um, staff are looking to kind of ad adapt their, their, their practice and their teaching. Um, I suppose the learning environment then that you can expect to achieve, it's a flexible learning environment. We're conscious that we have a variety of people that are working. Um, they might have different per per personal and professional circumstances. There's different reasons why people engage in postgraduate studies or top postgraduate studies. Um, so we operate an inclusive and flexible learning environment where people can engage as they they need and how they need to, 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 to meet the needs of their personal and professional context. So it's a, an inclusive learning environment and it's multi-level. So we operate at the individual level, um, kind of the peer level, and also looking at the application to practice and the external application of that. Um, you've, uh, you'll experience a quite a close relationship with your teaching staff. Uh, we do have a very um, supportive learning environment. There's a lot of supports for people. Um, and, you know, you will be in contact with your lecturer quite a lot through the, the um through the programme. Um, so overall, it's a very inclusive, flexible learning environment with a kind of variety of contemporary areas that we seek to address. That's Thanks, great. Emma. That's a great overview there. A lot to, to think about. Um, Ron and the Faculty of Arts would be your area of expertise. Do you want to just give us a little bit of information on that? Yeah, thank, thanks, Pat. Yeah, and welcome everyone. Yeah, um, so I'll just give you a brief overview of um, the postgraduate programmes we run the Faculty of Arts. 
So we have um, taught programs in, um, in geography, history, history, media studies, theology, um, Gelga and English. And um, we've got master's programs in each of those. We've also got a um, diploma in Christian leadership in theology and, and religious studies. Uh, uh, so the, I suppose there's a, a broad array of learning environments. Um, like education, we try to be as flexible as possible, but some of those programs are in person, others are blended. And then, uh, for example, the history is completely online. Uh, local history is actually in person. So, um, yeah, I suppose for for details on, on, on the actual modes that are involved, your your best um, bet is to go to the prospectus. Um, and that's it. I suppose what we can guarantee uh, in terms of our taught programs is um, dedicated supervision when it comes to the the research dissertation and I, I think we we're we're proud of of um, that aspect so I'll hand back to pass on that note yeah no thanks Ronan for that um good overview there um Julianne I suppose funding is obviously a huge issue now for for students uh, who are thinking of possibly doing a postgraduate program uh, do you want to speak to that maybe for a minute Hi everyone, um, so my name is Julianne Stack and I work um, in the Research and Graduate School here in MIC. Um, so as Graduate School Director, my remit is the Postgraduate Research Programmes. Um, Emma and Ronan would have oversight of the taught programmes in both faculties. <clears throat> And when I say research programmes, I mean either structured PhDs or PhDs by research alone or master's degrees by research and thesis. And um, all of those um, degrees are assessed by means of a thesis at the end and your contribution of knowledge. While there might be taught elements in some of our PhD programmes, it's the thesis at the end that uh, grants you a PhD or not and how you contribute to knowledge. To just to distinguish between um, the programmes that I administer and those um, that are overseen by my colleagues here and the assistant deans and director of top postgraduate programs. Um, so there are a variety of different funding schemes um, in MIC and outside of MIC for funding your postgraduate program. Um, for the taught postgraduate programs, um, have a look on our website. There's a few different um, routes um, for funding, um, including SUSE, um, which um, has a lot of different eligibility requirements, so that will be on it dependent on your own personal circumstances. We also have a number of sports scholarships and some varying one off um, scholarships um, every academic year as well. And all of that information is available on our supports section of the research and graduate school section of the website. We also then have some internal funding schemes that are directed at people undertaking research postgraduate degrees only. And these are our departmental assistantship scheme whereby you um, can obtain a fee waiver for the duration of your research postgraduate degree, plus a stipend. Um, it, it's not a huge stipend, but it, it does help. And uh, in return for that um, funding, uh, you would be required to undertake um, departmental duties, um, uh, maybe a few hours every week. And um, those competitions are run by the heads of department themselves. So please contact them if that is um, an interest of you. We also then have MIC postgraduate research merit scholarships. So they, we have three of them a year. They're competitive and the application period is currently open. And um, I think it closes on the 26th of April. And I'm very happy to take any questions on those schemes over the course of the next little while. Pat, I'll hand back to you. Yeah. No, that's great, Julianne. Thanks. So um, a lot there between our three panelists. And I suppose uh, we'll start to drill down into some of the uh, areas uh, that they have raised. But I suppose just to tell everyone, if you're just late joining there, if you do have any questions at any stage, there is a Q&A function. And if you just want to type in your question and post it there, I'll put it to uh, our panelists at some stage. So please do feel free to ask a question if you want to. And um, I think we might have a question in there now. One sec in our Q&A. Just get it up. 
notes after disappearing on me. Um, okay, so yeah, we have a question here from uh, Yaroslava, and they say, hello, can I please um, find out where I can get information about the graduate diploma in inclusive special, educa special education? Uh, they want to know uh, what hours they would attend, and is it online or in person? And do I need to work full time? So I, I don't know who wants to take. Yeah, do you want to go with that? Um, yeah. Emma, yeah. Um, so thanks for your question. So the graduate diploma in inclusive uh, special education is is different probably from the rest of our programs in that it's department the funded by the Department of Education. Um, so for that, it's usually teachers who are within a school. Um, they would need to talk to their school about um, getting um, cover. So the, the, it, it, it's in blocks that program runs. I think it's six weeks. Um, and you receive backfill for your teaching. So um, I think the department might give money for, for you to backfill your teaching and they'll release you for the six week period. So it's 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 full time for the block periods, um, but it's all funded by the department. So the best protocol would be to talk to the principal in your school or the board of management. And also, um, it, I think the closing date is quite soon. It's the 16th of April. So um, maybe get your application in in the meantime while you're, you're talking to um, to, to to your line manager. OK, thanks a million, Emma. And um, look, as I said, do please post any questions that you might have. So we have another question here from uh, Rachel, and this probably is more for you, Ronan. Uh, she wants to know when you graduate from the MA in history, do, be, do you become a qualified historian? Oh, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm not sure what a qualified historian is, but it certainly um um yeah gives you a certain status. So I suppose it makes you em employable in um in certain sectors, including in in um, education, but also in the cultural sector and the arts and and so on. Um, I don't think that like unlike f f the likes of um, medics or psychologists, I don't think. There's an accreditation associated with um, with the um, um, uh, with historians, as as far as I know, at least. So um, yeah, that's that's my short and not I'm I'm, I'm not um, um, hundred percent qualified, to, but I think that's that's the case. There there is no accreditation for uh, being an historian. Yeah. Okay. And I suppose, Ronan, if you wanted to be to teach or to work maybe in a university, you probably have to do a PhD after your MA as well. I would probably be the the best route as well, wouldn't it? If you're thinking of getting into academia, so, let's say. Yeah, certainly for academia and also for 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 teaching. There, yeah, you'll need a, a postgraduate um, um, qualification in in uh, specifically in 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 teaching as well. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, please do put in your questions. I see some of you are typing, but um, just while we're waiting for those questions to come through, uh, I might put one to you, Julianne. I suppose a lot of people tonight, some of them might be our own students, but others might be students who have, um, you know, it might be from other colleges or maybe they're out of education for a number of years. But I suppose the question they might be asking is why MIC? So I suppose why would you do a postgraduate programme in Mary Immaculate College? I think one of the things that we have going for us in MIC is actually our smaller size. Um, we have around 200 postgraduate research students and I can hand on heart say I would know the majority of them um, via personal communications by email if we haven't met in person as well. We have a lot of distance based students, but we really do take pride in MIC on um, being, you know, a, a very accessible and contactable face um, with any problems that people are having from the very initial inquiries on how to apply and um, getting registered and, you know, kind of looking after our students all the way through their academic program via their annual progression um, of apply, giving mentorship on applying for funding or skills training. A lot of that is very bespoke and in response to our student requests on I could really do with some extra information on um, you know such and such an area or have you any advice on how to go along with you know with something and so I, I really do think that's one of our real strengths on top of that then our academic staff are extraordinarily well qualified and well published and um, are very strong leaders in their fields in various disciplines. 
Okay, no, that's great. Thanks, Julianne. We have a couple of questions in there. Um, so we have one from Lisa and Lisa wants to know which master's degree would be best for someone who hopes to pursue vice principal principal roles in the future. And uh, she's completed a BA in education, uh, Irish or Gaelga and business studies uh, would be and she'd be more interested in part time kind of study. So that might be for you, Emma. They're obviously a, a student on our Torless campus at, at some stage. Yeah. Um, thanks for your question, Lisa. So um, probably the best programme for those who are looking to progress to kind of more senior roles would be the uh, MED in Education, Leadership and Management. Um, so that gives you um, a broad set of skills to prepare you for kind of managerial positions. Um, you, you were saying it's inter you're interested in part time there. So this is a part time flexible programme over two years. Um, the modules, so you would have uh, nine modules over the two years. They're generally delivered in blocks of four weeks. Um, so in the first year, you'll be taking six modules. Um, the first three modules, there's one on leadership and management theories. There's one on education and the law, and there's one on evidence-based approaches uh, to practitioner research. Um, that gives you good grounding in engaging with literature and databases and stuff like that. Um, and then after Christmas, then um, you have inclusive leadership, uh, inclusive education module. Um, you have an elective on open and distributed leadership. Uh, there's a, a module on culture um, and there's also a module on school self-evaluation, which a lot of leaders would have to engage in as part of their their role. Um, so and then the second year is your master's uh, dissertation uh, module and, and like Ronan's faculty, you're, you're, you're assigned a supervisor and you engage in weekly classes that guide you and develop you with the research skills to become uh, a, a, a leader, a research leader in the area. Um, so I think that's the most appropriate. Usually we have about 14 or 15 on that programme. All of them are going for managerial roles. We have a variety of practitioners and um, uh, existing school leaders, retired school leaders, um, and our, our own lecturers as well that would have significant experience in leadership. So um, you get a good grounding. Um, we have delivered law modules, some of these are barrister and law um, and specialised in education. So you get a good overview of, of, of the role of a leader and a good grounding with, with regards to all aspects of leadership in that programme. So that would be the one I would recommend. Um, and as I said, it's part time as well. So. That's great, Emma. Thanks a million for that. Um, I might put this one to you, Julianne. Uh, this person wants to know if, if you're a past student, um, just one sec, if you're a past student uh, from MIC with first class honours uh, degree, is there a, a reduction in fees for the structured PhD? So MIC, actually, this is something I forgot to mention in my initial intro. So MIC have what's called um, a president scholarship scheme for its past graduates, whereby if you get a first class honours degree, uh, you're offered a scholarship um, whereby you get a, I think it's 1500 euro reduction for the first two years of a PhD programme or for the duration of a master's programme and um, within normal duration of programme. Now that offer only lasts for three years. So if you've graduated more than three years ago, I would advise that you contact the president's office to ask if you can still use that reduction of that president's scholarship. Um, so that would be my advice. That's great. Thanks, Julianne. Um, Emma, we just have a follow up question there from Lisa to, to that previous question you just answered. Uh, Lisa wants to know um, how much teaching experience would you recommend uh, before engaging in the course? Yeah, so usually we recommend two to three years teaching experience and we recommend them to be uh, working or working in an educational context as well, because a lot of the assignments are to do with practice based context. So a two to three years, Lisa, would 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 be sufficient. Okay. Um, next question then is from Gillian, and it's probably for you again, Lee, um, Emma. Uh, they have experience in climate action and sustainability, corporate training, and uh, is interested in. Um, sorry, now one sec. It's just after moving them here, and is interested in pursuing a, a career, an education career in this area. Would I be eligible for the M Ed program in this area without a teaching qualification? Um, yeah, I probably can answer that. So yeah, um, anyone else jump in if they want to as well. I think it's so I'm not sure, Gillian, um, are you looking at becoming a qualified teacher um, or if 
who are just interested in kind of looking at the whole area of climate action sustainability within the corporate training environment. Um, so if you're looking to uh, become a teacher within a school, it wouldn't qualify you to, it wouldn't give you a teaching qualification to teach in a school, but you absolutely can take the programme without a teaching qualification, but it just wouldn't qualify you to teach, teach in a school. So we have in this programme, we have um, a lot of people that aren't teachers. So uh, we have some in community based education, we have some in early years education, we have other people that are, um, you know, in, in training environments. So absolutely, you can take the programme if 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 you don't have um, a teaching qualification, but it just won't qualify you to register with the teaching council. Yeah, thanks a million, Emma, and it's great to see the questions coming in. So please feel free to type in your question into the Q&A there at any stage if you want me to put something to uh, our panel here this evening. Um, we have another question now from Lena, and they, uh, she wants to know, do you have any information on the assignments on the MED in leadership and of well-being and education? Are they linked to school-based practice and can it be undertaken if you are a current uh, practicing teacher? So do you want to go with that, Emma, maybe? Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> again. So yeah, the MED in uh, leadership and well-being and education, again, it attracts a kind of a diverse group. So we do have people from um, early years and kind of uh, adult and further ed um, and community-based education in that as well. Um, most, most of the assignments would involve applying theory to practice. Um, and you might be in a group with with teachers or you would need some experience of being a teacher. So sometimes we have people that, you know, might take a career break for a year and they'll go back to the programme, but they have the practical experience that they can talk about, you know, in, in a past situation or in a in a class. This is what they would have done and they would have made designs for lessons or um, teaching or or whatever. Um, for them when they do go back to teaching. So um, as long as you've some experience in education um, and it doesn't have to be teaching, it has, can be education in general um, and that you can apply the theory to practice, that's absolutely fine. Great, thanks, um, Emma. And uh, just on that question before that, Gillian just put in the, the chat and the Q&A function there that I would, she's thinking of uh, an education or business, presumably area. So. I don't know, does that make any difference, Emma, or do you want to say anything on that? No, so probably sustainability or corporate social responsibility in, in business and maybe setting up our own business. So um, no, it wouldn't. Yeah, you could do. Yeah, OK, thanks, Mel. Uh, Ronan, I might just put one to you. Um, we often, I suppose, people who if they're thinking of doing a postgraduate programme, um, you know, sometimes they look at the research profiles of the staff in the college. So um, is there any kind of particular areas, um, particularly I suppose in the Faculty of Education that our staff excel in maybe that uh, you'd like maybe to bring the to the attention of some of the uh, people who are listening tonight? Uh, to the Faculty of Arts, yeah. You're, you're yeah, yeah, I suppose, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so um, yeah, so I'd like to, I mean, across, we have 13 departments and um, I mean, it's true to say that in each of those departments, we have um, experts and people who are, who are um, highly acclaimed uh, nationally, or indeed in some cases internationally, in their fields. And so maybe I can focus on, uh, well, my own area is, is, is mathematics. And we have um, um, internationally recognized researchers in the areas of algebraic, geometry and um, also people who will be um, um, acclaimed in mathematics education nationally. Um, then, I mean, you could look across, for example, um, at Gaelga. I mean, they've got some um, uh, highly reputed um, academics there in cultural leadership um, and in um, 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 I suppose medieval literature and, and also um, the English department has very well well published academics um, right across the board in that in that department. So that's just to name a few. I mean, um, if if somebody was interested in a particular department, I'd be uh, happy to to direct them towards individuals as well. 
Yeah. No, thanks a million, Ronan. Um, we've a couple of more questions now in on the Q&A. So um, let me see. The next one was uh, just from Laura. And uh, I might put, put this to you, to Julianne, it's about the President's Scholarship. Uh, Laura graduated in 2022 with a 1-1 in uh, the B.Ed. So she wants to know, would I qualify for the President's Scholarship? Um, at the moment, yeah, Laura, your initial letter of offer is still valid. So if you are applying for a course for next September, you just state that in the application form that you're using that. Um, if it's not going to be for another year or two, as I said, write to the president's office um, beforehand to ask if you can perhaps um, gain an extension for it. Great. Thanks, Julianne. And another just follow on question just popped into the uh, Q&A there uh, from Lisa. And Lisa wants to know, how do you apply for the President's Scholarship? So if you want to you just say a little bit about that. You can't actually apply for it. It's only offered to MIC graduates who got a first class honours degree um, in their bachelor's uh, degree here. Um, so that's it. Sorry. <laughs> OK, um, we have another question there from Pamela and it's uh, Pamela wants to know she's a final year student in MIC undertaking the early childhood care program. Uh, she's interested in starting an Irish course to gain the qualification needed to go further to primary teaching. Can you please give advice on this? So any of you want to jump in on that? Sir? So take I is the exam that you went. Mm. They would just need to maybe contact TEG and see is there any courses yeah. that, that they provide that would I would advise. Yeah. So TEG it, is the what you would look yeah. for and maybe contact yeah. them and see is there any preparation courses. Yeah, so they're probably thinking of doing the professional masters of education. Maybe it's a two year masters. We have to qualify level eight graduates uh, who want to become a primary school teacher. So yeah, as part of that, there's an oral Irish examination called the TEG exam. But um, just in case um, uh, Laura, if you don't, maybe if you think that you don't have the Irish qualification to H4, um, there are um, alternative options that they will accept for that. So one is if you do an arts degree and you pass four starts, you do Irish in it. But another is there's different diploma programs uh, that most of the uh, third level institutions have, like UL, Galway, uh, Trinity, UCD, Minute and so on, uh, diplomas in Irish. Um, if you take one of them, that will meet the H4 entry requirements in Irish, just in case that's kind of a, another area you're a little bit uh, concerned about. But I'd advise you to just go to the postgraduate section of our website and just look up the professional masters of education there, look at the entry requirements and you'll see all the information there about that, about what you'd uh, need to do. So that would be uh, worth having a look at. Um, next question then we have is about the professional doctorate in education and child psychology. Um, this person says they're finding it hard to get clarification on whether they're meeting the entry requirements. There's two elements to entry experience in education, which they have as a post primary uh, SAT, and then a degree in psychology recognized by the Psychological Society of Ireland is also needed. So they did an arts degree in uh, Mary Immaculate in 2018, and they did maths and psychology. And they want to know basically, uh, would anyone know if this meets the psychology course requirement? I can jump in here. My honest answer yeah. is I'm not sure and I don't want to fob you off. I would advise that you contact the course coordinator um, with your exact qualifications and ask them to confirm um, that their contact details will be listed on the website. Um, I, I don't want to lead you astray. I'm just not sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that's probably the best advice, uh, Julianne, and you'll find that all if you just go to the program page on our website, you'll find uh, contact details there. Um, we have another question then from uh, Sarah, and Sarah is interested in the MED and Leadership of Wellbeing uh, course, but she only has one year's uh, teaching experience. So she says the website states you need at least two as an entry requirement. She saw for other master's degrees that the university's recognition of prior learning policy acted as a, as a kind of a loophole to the two year entry requirement. And some people may be offered an interview or some form of screening. Might this be possible for the MED in leadership program? Yes, so it depends on the extent of um, the prior learning that you have. 
Uh, Sarah, what I would do is I would contact um, the programme director. So it's Jared Farley. Um, Jared is really lovely. Um, I would email him and ask him to meet. And actually, anybody that's thinking of undergoing a programme, you know, I, this is kind of an information session, but I would recommend you contact the course coordinator just to have a chat and, you know, make sure that you know that, that it meets your needs um because some people are obviously are undertaking this for particular purposes so sarah um i would contact jared farley um and he will talk to you about he'll get more information on the extent of your prior learning and if it's sufficient um uh, to apply so yeah i'd recommend to contact jared okay thanks very much emma so uh, maybe Ronan, I might put this one to you. Um, what are the advantages, I suppose, of doing a postgraduate program, I suppose, particularly maybe in the Faculty of Arts? So does it increase your job prospects, for example? Yeah, th thanks, Pat. Yeah, I suppose um, there are a few factors you should um, carefully consider when you're um, thinking about doing a taught postgraduate program. One, I suppose one is um, love i mean we can't discount it the love of learning so you should have that initially you know you should um because it it, it does require a lot of dedication a lot of hours uh, it's a big it's a financial commitment and so on so the love of learning needs to be there in terms of job prospects um yeah well in a, in an environment um, nowadays where um almost everyone you'll be competing against as will have an undergraduate degree it certainly can give give an edge if if your postgraduate um, qualification is in 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 the right area, and um, indeed for particular niche areas, I mean your your um, your your postgraduate qualification might actually get get you in in the door. Might well actually be the the clincher in terms of um, um, getting getting you a, a a job in a particular area what i'd also say it's very important to consider is i mean you need to really to to do the research on what the program entails um talk to the as as emma has emphasized it's very important to talk to the program coordinator um, they may even be able to give you um um and um, their uh, impressions from previous students, students who've been through it, what their experiences have been. Um, so that's all. I mean, it's important before you make the decision um, to be be sure that you're going to the, the right place. You know, it's it's um, the, the right place for you and for your for your studies. And um, as I said before, what what is what makes Mary I, I think stand out from other institutions is because we're small, we do have the possibility um, to give that close um, supervision um, for the for the dissertation aspect. Um, and I think we've, we've got the reputation of being a very uh, caring environment as well. So yeah, that's what I would say. Cheers. Thanks very much for that, uh, Ronan. Uh, please do feel free to pop in your questions into the Q&A there if you do have anything for our three panellists. Um, we have another question from Lisa, and uh, it's probably for you, Emma. Uh, Lisa wants to know, do you have to complete an interview in the application for every master's degree? So, for example, the MA in Education and Leadership. Um, so not every pro uh, not every program application requires an interview. Um, some programs where you might fall short of the minimum entry requirements, they might request an interview, but not all of them. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's it, it depends on the program, but not every program. As far as I'm aware, if you have the minimum entry requirements for the MED in Education, Leadership and Management, you don't need to complete an interview. But if if you don't have the minimum requirements, you may have to. Okay, that's great. Um, we might just uh, dive into the funding maybe for a minute, Julianne. You mentioned some of the opportunities that are available uh, for postgraduate students in the college. Um, I suppose uh, what people might want to know, I suppose, is how are the scholarships, uh, the fellowships, etc., how are they awarded? And I suppose does it depend on the grade that you got in your undergraduate degree? So uh, feel free maybe that's to talk a, a little really bit about that. That's a really interesting question. So I'm going to talk about the postgraduate research merit um, competition. 
Um, so these are um, ones that are offered to all intending um, MIC postgraduate research students, but also current MIC um, postgraduate research students can apply for them as well. How you apply for them is via an application form. And in that application form, you are asked for details of your academic qualifications. Um, your grades are noted for sure. Um, but also you have to give a very detailed outline of your planned research um, program and also what you intend using the um, research degree for, you know, your career plans in the future. And so the criteria um, they're assigned to that. So kind of your academic track record, your um, research potential and the excellence of your research proposal and how you're going to use it forward. So yes, your academic, um, obviously the better qualification, standard qualifications you have, the better for yourself going forward. But you don't have to have a first class honours degree to be awarded um, a research merit postgraduate scholarship. No, um, it's, it, we really do look at the whole package altogether. Um, for the departmental assistantship competitions, um, um, they are handled individually within each department and the heads of department will have different criteria. It may be that they might be looking for people with a master's in their region. It might be that um, they are looking for people who already have teaching experience. Um, really, it, there's a lot of variable factors there. So I would advise you to contact the head of department there. For the sports scholarships, um, your sporting prowess as well as your academic um qualifications will be taken into account there. So we look to reward um, people who are striving to achieve excellence across a whole um, broad spectrum of their lives, including sports and um, their academic uh, qualifications, because we do recognise that it can be really hard for students to balance both of those. So it's great to see that rewarded coming through. I hope I've answered that question there, Pat, actually. I mean, yeah, no, I, I think, yeah. no, no, that's good. And a good, a good, good to mention the sports scholarships as well, which mm. is something maybe people mightn't uh, necessarily think about uh, initially. And um, I suppose, Julianne, if, even if you don't get an MI, any of those um, scholarships or assistantships at Mary Immaculate College, are there any other potential areas you could explore to get uh, other sources of yeah, funding? Yeah, there are. So um, once you're kind of within the college and a registered student, um, or even if you are intending to come, um, we offer mentorship in the research and graduate school in applying for external funding from the Irish Research Council. Um, if that's something of interest to you, then please have a look at the IRC website and then make contact with me and we can have a chat on that in the spring. The um, application period for that on an annual basis is kind of September, October, October, but you really, really need to start thinking about it a good few months in advance because the application form, while it just looks like a simple Microsoft Word document, it's actually quite involved and you need to think about your planned research and all of your um, previous qualifications and work experience with quite a different view than what you'd have done already. So that is um, the most common external funding um, scheme that people apply for. For those of you who are qualified teachers and um, the Teaching Council, the INTO and the ASTI, they all offer um, annual research bursaries and scholarship and MIC students actually have a really good track record in applying for and being successful in those. So I would encourage you to apply for those as well. Um, and then we have various kind of one off scholarships that kind of pop up and um, that I advertise to our students as, as they appear. That's great, uh, Julianne. And of course, you can always check it out uh, on our website as well if you Absolutely. want to get a bit or more detail. Absolutely. Or contact me directly as well. We can have a chat about your specific circumstances. Great. Thanks, uh, Julianne. Um, just a question I might put to all three of you and anyone that's just listening, please do put in any questions you have into the Q and A, and I put them to our to our panelists. But uh, I might put this to all three of you. I suppose the role of a supervisor is obviously very important across postgraduate level, particularly I suppose even a PhD level, even more so. But um, for someone who's thinking of possibly doing um, a postgraduate MA or even maybe going on to a PhD in the future, how do, how do you go about identifying a supervisor and, and maybe just explain a little bit about how, how that whole process works? Um, I might jump in there actually yep. because um, I think it kind of goes across all the faculties and the graduate school. So 
it's kind of a symbiotic process, really, whereby um, you would need to have quite a decent idea of what it is you're going to research in the first place and perhaps the outlines of a research proposal and the guidelines for preparing that are on our um, section of the MIC internet. Um, it's how to prepare, how to apply for a research degree and there's thesis guidelines. And once you have a kind of a very solid idea of, say, the particular figure in history that you might want to research or um, you might have an idea of an intervention that you might do in the classroom, then you have a look at the research profiles of the faculty members in the most relevant department. Now, in education, you might need to go through a couple of different departments to see which one fits right, because we have people with a lot of different overlapping research interests in that. In arts, it tends to be a little bit more focused. You will find a history supervisor really only in the Faculty of History. Um, so that's and then what you would do is um, you would contact that person um, personally, uh, very politely and um, outline your research plans and ask them, do they have availability to supervise um, a PhD or a research master's student in the forthcoming academic year? And would they be available to have a chat? And they may or may not be available. They may or may not have um, the expertise, the niche expertise in that area. But our faculty members are hugely helpful and they will get get back to you. I um, can predict with almost certainty and say they either don't have availability or they're not taking on new students or they may not have the right expertise, but then they may helpfully point you in a different direction and wish you the best look. Or they may say, actually, this looks really interesting. Uh, let's have a chat on this. Thanks a million, Julianne. Um, and I suppose the other, I suppose just to anyone that's listening, we have about uh, just under five minutes left. So if you do have any questions, do pop them into the Q&A. Uh, it's probably your last opportunity now. Um, assessment, I suppose, is a big thing for many students, especially when you're coming from undergraduate level. Um, I might put it to you first, maybe Ronan. How does assessment kind of work at postgraduate level? Um, is it very different to the way it is when you're doing your undergraduate degree? Uh, I know if you might maybe speak kind of generally, or maybe across the board, and uh, in terms of the Faculty of Arts programs, and then I might get Emma and maybe and Julianne to, to pop in on that as well. Yeah, thanks, Pat. So, um, yeah, and on the taught um, master's programs, just um, it's hard to, to speak. Uh, with total generality on it, but um, it's very common, I think, to have continual assessment in terms of um, assignments. Yeah, so there's certainly a move away from um, terminal exams that you would would have encountered in at undergraduate level. Um, so for for many of the subjects, there would be essay uh, based assessments or project based assessment. Uh, for media, it can take diff different forms, so it might be um, audiovisual um, components there as well. Yeah, so it, I suppose it it really, um, it, yeah, it's certainly a move away from terminal exams, sit sit down exams. Um, very often there will be um, project based work where people are working in pairs or or groups as well. Um, and presentations um, in the arts, the communicative skills are, are very emphasized at postgraduate level. So presentations are important and that's all very good preparation then for for um, competing for for jobs in the workplace and so on. So yeah, that's that's a, I guess an overview um, of, of assessments really. Thanks, Aaron. Anything to add to that, Emma or Julianne? Emma? No, I, I suppose ours would be similar. It would be continued assessment for postgraduate education in a, a variety of different modes. So um, everybody has a chance to showcase their skills um, and there's an opportunity for everybody um, in that. So it would be similar to, to, to what Roman said. OK, for the research degrees, they're slightly different. Um, so, for example, the professional doctorate in educational and child psychology, the assessments um, 
of students on that program are via their professional placements, also taught assignments, but then also they have to produce a research thesis at the end that needs to contribute to their discipline. For our research masters and PhD students, um, some of them, some of the PhD students might have taught elements in their programs and they will have to undergo normal types of assessments such as Ronan and Emma have outlined there. But and every year we have what's called a research review panel, which um, examines and investigates the amount of progress that students have made over the course of the year to make sure that it's appropriate and that they're on the right track and their supervisory setup is all um, appropriate. But the main assessment, it's a, a pass fail assessment at the end of their degree, whereby they submit a thesis, quite a substantial thesis of between 60 to 100,000 words, usually depending on the format of it, um, for examination by um, experts in the field. And then they have an oral defence of that thesis called a Viva Voce examination. And the outcomes are that they either get their PhD or their research MA, and there's no viva for a research MA actually, just to correct myself. Um, they either get the degree without corrections or they most commonly have, have to do some um, corrections over a period of few months. And um, occasionally then we have someone who has to kind of go back on the register and um, make more substantial changes. But that's that's the main um, uh, assessment method in research degrees. That's great. Thanks very much, Julianne. So I suppose our time is almost up. So maybe I just might put this question to all three of you just before we finish. Um, I suppose, could you just quickly give maybe any advice you'd give to someone who's thinking of applying for a potential postgraduate course in the college, maybe in the coming weeks and months? Just um, I suppose your number one piece of advice that you would give to them. Uh, Emma, start off with you, maybe, Emma. Yeah, I think Ronan actually covered it nicely there a while ago. You did a great job. I think you've reacted it, Ronan. Um, definitely do a lot of research, talk to as many people as possible, talk to the programme director, or you can email myself if if and I can put you in contact with them. Um, it's important, you know, that you have, you know, you're 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 choosing the course that best reflects your needs as as a person and a professional. So I think um really reaching out to the, the programme director would be my my advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ronan? Yeah, absolutely. The, pro the, pro the program um, director is the the expert on, on the program, so they would they should be your your first point of contact really after you've done your, your own research and, and gone through the to the prospectus, of course. Yeah. Final word with you then, Julianne. Um, as Emma and Ronan have both said, think very carefully about what degree is right for you and why you want to do that PH, that degree. Um, I would really advise against doing a postgraduate degree because you don't know what to do next. OK, mm -hmm. it's a very time consuming, expensive amount of energy to be expended um, be, when you're kind of putting off a decision that you have to make um, later on down the line. So it is something that um, takes a lot of consideration and thought, but uh, we are very happy to um, speak with you, meet with you and um, advise you on what all of these programmes entail to make sure that it's the right decision for you. We want you to be happy in the programme and successfully complete it. So please contact us directly um, if you have any queries. That's great. Thanks very much, Julianne, and thanks to all our panel members this evening, to Emma, Ronan and Julianne. Um, I think you covered a huge amount there in a very short space of time, so thanks very much again. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined us. Uh, hopefully you found it beneficial, and um, I suppose if you do have any questions or you want to know more in the coming days or weeks, uh, please do go to our website. You can sign up for our postgraduate newsletter uh, at the website, uh, mic.ie forward slash study at mic forward slash postgraduate. You can sign up for our postgraduate newsletter there and get lots of information regularly. And also you can just check out the website as well, maybe for the particular courses that you're interested in. And we do have a Q&A function on our website as well called Pubble. So you can put in a question into that and someone will get back to you in, in some stage as well. So thanks very much everyone for everything this evening, uh, for tuning into us, for all our panelists. And uh, this brings our session to a close and enjoy the rest of your evening.